everybody. Welcome to this week's podcast. I should have most audio podcast services fixed by this week. I know some services, especially iTunes, haven't been working well. Um, on the back end, I was having issues too, and I migrated everything over to a new platform, and I think all the services are fixed except iTunes. I keep emailing them and the other podcast providers, and I keep getting those automated, you know, due to high volume, we can't so whatever. Um, I'm trying my best, but I have no idea what the problem with iTunes is at this point. It could just be that so many more people are trying to upload stuff that they're overwhelmed. I, I don't know, but I'm definitely trying my best. The link to the new host is going to be in the main post on Retro RGB. So it's still available for direct download for whoever that's easiest for. And all of the other podcast platforms should be working. So as always, I want you all to listen to this or watch this, whatever is easiest for you. Seeing, you know, clicks on the video is always nice, but I'd rather reach more people in the easiest way possible than worry about YouTube views or something. So uh, links, as always, will be in the main post for these, and hopefully it works out for, for iTunes at some point. First up, RetroFrog is now selling a vertical stand for the RetroTink 5X that I think is absolutely awesome. You place the RetroTink inside it. It also has a holder for the remote control, which I think is great because many of us have a hard time keeping track of where each one of our remotes are and what remote goes to what device. So having the little holder thing right there alone is good. Um, and also it has a strap around the side so that if you want to route your SCART cable, kind of looped around the front and then pointing out the back, this will strap it close to the stand and keep everything looking really nice and having all of the cables all point in one direction. So uh, as long as you don't mind your RetroTINK 5X oriented vertically, so Tate mode your RetroTINK, um, this thing is probably the perfect solution. Uh, I'm always a fan of, of stuff like this, especially when people get to make products that complement other products as well. It's one of these everybody wins scenarios. You know, Todd gets to sell a bunch on RetroFrog it's a, a great accompaniment to the RetroTINK 5X, and we get cool stuff that we want. So this is one of those everybody wins scenarios. Now, as always, uh, you know, my, my gift and my curse, if you will, is that I see something like this, and I appreciate how awesome it is, and I also see what else I would like to see from a product like this. So maybe the open source community would jump in and help, but I would love to see something like... Uh, a Genesis 1, Sega CD1 combo, where you slide the RetroTINK 5X into a device that looks kind of similar to a Sega CD1, just for aesthetics, and that breaks out the SCART and maybe even adds VGA and composite connections to the back. And heck, if I'm dreaming, what if even the front flips down so you could hold the remote in the front of it? So I think that would be a neat idea, except designing a 3D printed thing to work like that is really challenging. And designing a circuit board or probably a combination of circuit boards to route all of those things is even more challenging because you have to make sure that all of the traces get routed in a way where you don't add interference because it would be kind of useless if your SCART connection now doesn't look as good as if you plugged it directly in. So I'm going to keep dreaming on that one. I don't know if that's even possible, but I just wanted to throw the idea out there because I know there's so many awesome open source people that would be willing to jump in and make these things and share them with people. So just wanted to float the idea. But if you want a not crazy idea that's available now, check out the RetroFrog vertical stand. Developer Stephanie Allaire has just opened pre-orders on an FPGA-based YM2612 audio chip replacement, and the software that's running on this FPGA is actually Hotego's open source core. So I love this for so many different reasons. First is now anybody who's using any kind of device that has a 2612 in it, whether it's an original Sega Genesis or something else, now has a drop-in replacement that should work identically with the same pin spacing, just desolder the old one, put this one in its place, and you're done. But it's not just that that's the cool part. This is one of the few times that we've seen somebody take the software FPGA recreation of these chips and make it into a piece of hardware. And it's happened, but not as commonly as you would think, and it's really cool to see this implemented. And it's also cool because this opens the door for lots of other stuff. Um, you know, once people start seeing that these things can be done, I think a lot more people might be jumping on the train and following as well. Because, I mean, imagine a scenario which you have something like this, um, but you could also run a switch to the back of your Genesis and flip between the 2612 and the other chip that was found in the later model Genesis consoles, like most Model 2 and 3s and everything. So now you could have both audio chips 
Uh, FBX actually did that last year, but it required a bunch of original chips, whereas this is an original replacement. But even farther past that, imagine arcade boards where you have certain proprietary chips that aren't that complicated compared to like a CPU or GPU, but that are known to die. So with an FPGA recreation of it, you should be able to replace it with something like this and now revive that original arcade board. So the possibilities are absolutely endless for stuff like this. Um, I'm so appreciative when the hardware and software people come together to have to make stuff like this. And if you needed one, the price is $50 plus shipping, and it should be able to be used in pretty much anything that uses a YM2612. So I'm looking forward to people trying this out and kind of giving their feedback on it because I just think this is, while, while replacing the audio chip in itself is a very cool thing and I'm happy to talk about it, I just think what this represents is kind of a new chapter of what could be done with FPGA technology and integrating it with original hardware. Pre-orders are now open on an officially licensed reproduction of Mega Man Wily Wars for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive. Um, now, this is a game that's kind of like Super Mario All-Stars, but for Mega Man. So it's the reimagining of the 8-bit versions of a bunch of Mega Man games, but playable on the 16-bit Sega Genesis. And this game has been kind of notorious over the years because it was never released on cartridge in most regions. I believe the U.S. got it on the Sega channel, but not many people had that, uh, at least relative to Genesis owners. And... While the ROM has been available for a while, there's been tons of issues depending on which version you have. So even if you are able to hunt down the correct version, um, what if you lose it? What if you format your card and you get to download it again? I, I always ended up with the wrong version that doesn't save right, runs at the wrong speed, crashes, whatever else. So this is the first repro, official repro, that I am genuinely really, really excited about. Um, now, unfortunately, the price is $70, and it comes with a whole bunch of collector-y stuff that uh, if you're a collector, you're going to be excited about. If you're just a grumpy old nerd like me, um, it's I'd rather have had a $50 option for just the cartridge, the case, and the sleeve, and the manual. You know, So basically what you would have expected back in the day if this were an official release. But I pre-ordered it anyway, just because I, I thought you know this was the one of the first, if not only, repros that I was really psyched about. Just because I know when you plug it in, it's going to work properly. You don't have to worry about ROM revisions. It's a game that I've never completed that I always wanted to and never got around to. Um, and as far as being confident in the repro itself, the boards were designed by Renee from DB Electronics. So you could guarantee that they're going to be beveled edge. You can guarantee they're going to run at the right voltage. Um, and unless the factory does the switcheroo, it should be hard gold on the pads as well. Although that is generally the least of my concerns because that's more of a longevity thing, whereas the other two are safety based. Uh, but I mean, uh, with it going through Renee for the quality assurance check to make sure that they came out all right, I'm pretty sure whoever buys this is going to get the best of all worlds. An actual cartridge that you could safely use on all revisions of Genesis that will work just like an original, as well as a really nice bundle of collector's edition stuff along with it. So I'm pretty fired up about this one. You could pre-order it in a bunch of different places. Uh, of course, I always put the Castlemania games uh, link first because I always try to help out the, the smaller stores. Not that Ryan's a small store, but compared to like limited run games, definitely. So I'd rather send Ryan my money than anybody else. But I pre-ordered it and you could bet that I'm going to live stream when it comes in, even though I'm sure everybody is going to be sick of seeing Wily Wars live streams. Whatever. You don't have to watch it. I'm still going to do it and I'm still going to enjoy the heck out of it. So, uh, you know, thanks to everybody involved for getting this out the door. The project's been going on for a couple of years. I know back at uh, Retrobit. So uh, I'm glad to see it finished officially licensed by Capcom and available for all of us to purchase. And also the pre-orders are going to stay open for a month. So there's none of this rush to get it by the end of the day or you'll never see it again crap. Just by the time you hear this podcast, it should be still available. You could pre-order it and just know it'll show up um, you know, within a few months. Last weekend, I did a live stream podcast with Tian Fong, Ratboy, and Renee from DB Electronics to discuss open source and how it pertains to retro gaming, what the different types of implementations we've seen are, and our opinions on, on how we think it should be looked at depending on the situation. I thought it was an absolutely awesome podcast. I really enjoyed it. It is a little more towards the nerdier side, 
So I would say anybody that's just a little bit more interested in nerd stuff should be okay with it. You don't need to be an expert or anything like that. Um, but if you're just a casual gamer, I'm not sure if this one's for you. I mean that with respect, of course. But uh, if you're even slightly interested in the nerdy side of things, or more importantly, how to, how to really differentiate between people who use open source correctly and don't. So what's stealing? What probably isn't stealing, but it isn't really the way you're supposed to do it. And of course, what is the way that's celebrated and appreciated when people make or reuse open source stuff? I think that a lot of clarity was added to that. And even things that I wasn't 100% sure on, I feel a lot more confident about my understanding, thanks to the awesome people that joined me on this. Um, you know, every time I do a live stream, and, and heck, every time I do a podcast, I end up having something come out the wrong way that wasn't how I intended in my head and it fell out my face the wrong way. And it happened a couple times on this one. And I think we re-explained everything fine. I think by the time the podcast ended, our message was pretty clear, even uh, even if I stumbled over my words or something and said something the wrong way. So if you do listen, just keep in mind, if you hear me say something and you go, that doesn't sound right, just give it a minute. We'll, we'll fix it. But um, I think if you're listening to any podcast I'm a part of, you're kind of used to that anyway. But uh, my apologies. <laughs> so if you would like to listen to this, it's available absolutely everywhere on every podcast service, except maybe iTunes, like I said before. Uh, and it's also available as a video wherever all videos are hosted. Uh, so please check it out if you're interested. And I, I just really appreciated uh, this crew taking the time to talk about this stuff because I think people who kind of didn't understand the full spectrum of open source and how it applies to retro gaming you're still not going to but you'll have a better grasp of it and we'll definitely do another one in the future to kind of help bring things around again. Retro Gamer Store has just opened pre-orders on a smoke transparent shell for the Super Nintendo, and this is different from the other pre-orders they had open. That was just a clear shell, which I thought was awesome, and this is a smoke transparent shell. So it's very similar to what they did for their PC Engine shells. Both, I think, look absolutely awesome. And like last time, a minimum order of 500 is required. So you could pre-order now for about 110 plus shipping. And if the minimum order of 500 isn't met, they'll fully refund everybody by, I think, July or something like that. Um, and if it does go through, they're aiming to ship around August. Uh, now, these are not cheap but that doesn't mean that they're not for everybody. I did have their shell for the PC Engine, and I thought it was really high quality, and I really liked it a lot. And I think that if the Super Nintendo is your favorite console, and you have one that's yellowed and cracked, this might be an excellent replacement. And don't forget, too, that even if uh, you just have a perfectly you know, good condition Super Nintendo and you want this... I would list your original shell for a reasonable price, of course, up for sale anywhere, because there's probably a lot of people out there that have yellowed, cracked, and falling apart original Super Nintendo shells, and they like this, but they just would rather have the original. Everybody kind of wins, so just don't throw out your original shell if it's in good shape, uh, and heck, even if it's yellowed and cracking, may there might be still some fun stuff you could do with it, but overall, I just I, I like that there's replacement shells finally being made. I believe like last time, it's just the top and bottom shell, not the controller ports, not the buttons or anything like that, which is fine in my opinion. Uh, I would like to see more pictures with everything assembled. And it looks like they've confirmed more compatible, uh, more compatible, ah, why am I messing this up? Compatibility for more motherboard <laughs> revisions. So if you're not sure if yours will fit, just check out the list I put in the post here. And if you have any one of these motherboards, it will fit. If you have other models, uh, it might fit, it probably will, but there's no absolute guarantee. Also, they did tease a potential Super Famicom version of the shell, uh, but those are not going to be up for sale, if at all, for at least a few months, I would think. So uh, if you have a, an original Super Nintendo, uh, not the small one, but the fat one, and you want a really nice replacement shell, definitely consider this one. The price is high, but I just, I'm not really sure you'd be able to get it much cheaper in smaller quantities like this. I do think people kind of forget that when you buy shells for 20 bucks, they're sometimes made in five or 10,000 quantities. So uh, it's kind of just not realistic these days to have something super cheap and good quality. But, uh, you know, not so cheap and good quality is definitely possible, and Retro Game Restore has done it before. So if you're into it, check this out. 
Rama has just added folder-based browsing to the XStation optical drive emulator. So before you were able to have folders on the micro SD card and sort the games any way you liked, which actually made it really easy for organization when you're transferring stuff over. But once you actually booted into the XStation, all of the games would just be listed in alphabetical order, regardless of subfolders. Now with this update, you could toggle a setting and everything will show its folder view. I have everything alphabetized, but I might change that up just to make it a little easier to scroll through, kind of figure out what's the best for each. But overall, uh, I just, I love little things like this. While it's not going to be the make or break feature for people using an XStation, I do really think it's awesome and I'm glad Rama took the time to add it. Um, in order to install it, just download the latest firmware, drop it in the 00XStation folder on the micro SD, then go into settings and hit update firmware. It'll automatically reboot, then you could go back into the settings and toggle folder browsing as yes. So that's another awesome thing, is if you just liked the original view, you don't have to use it. You have the choice. So choices are always great, and I think it was pretty awesome that this was able to be done. Uh, there was also a few other little updates involved uh, it, with this firmware update. So things like avoid SD card access while seeking, overall faster seek times. So the you know, not, it's not just a folder browsing update, it's a performance one too. So if you have an X station, seems like a no brainer. Download the free update, load it right on and give it a try. Um, and if you still haven't purchased one, I have links to US and UK sellers, as well as to micro SD cards that I've tested and used on it that seem to be working okay. So uh, if you have an X station, definitely upgrade. And if you were looking to buy one, uh, maybe consider it because it's pretty a stable product by now and it's something that uh, I think really adds quite a lot to the experience if you use ODEs. Uh, you know there's just a bunch of features and supposedly a bunch more coming. TubeTime has just released their open source recreation of an ISA video card that they're calling the Graphics Gremlin. So this is a video card that's an MDA or CGA based graphics card that's made from 100% new parts. Nothing was cannibalized from old machines. And this takes advantage of a Lattice FPGA chip in order to recreate that video card. And not only is it a drop-in replacement for an original, but it outputs via both a 9-pin RGB connector that outputs the same 15 kilohertz signal that original ISA video cards might have, or at least the ones that this is meaning to replace. But they've also added a 15 kilohertz VGA connector on there as well. So if you just have access to a, a more modern VGA CRT monitor, or I guess scaler or anything like that, Either one of them should work well, and I love that both choices are there. Um, now, they're not going to be mass producing and selling this device themselves, but instead they've released the entire project, including the KiCad compatible PCB, fi PCB files, uh, schematic libraries, and Verilog all to GitHub under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 4.0 International License. That's a mouthful. Um, but that license allows you to do a few things. So. Uh, you're able to share and, and redistribute this in any way, but you must give appropriate credit, provide a link to the license, and indicate if changes were made. Um, and also, if you remix, transform, or build upon the material, you must distribute your uh, contributions under the same license as the original. And I believe this also means you have to post your fork of the project as well. But there's no additional restrictions, which means uh, a reputable store could pick up this project and make a run of however many they're able to and sell them. And it's 100% you know, along with the rules and a very cool thing to do, in my opinion, you know, as long as credit's given and if they make any changes, they post it. But as far as just making a run of production of these and, and crediting the original, uh, all of the original links and the original creators, uh, not only is that allowed, but I think it would be celebrated. So if anybody out there, especially in the retro PC world, has the ability to do a production run of these, please consider it because I think this would be a pretty big help for people that are fans of original PCs but might be having trouble with their original graphics card or having trouble finding some new ones. Developer Ian Ford, a.k.a. Hoffman, has just released a port of the MSX2 version of Metal Gear for the Amiga. This, I believe, is available free to download for anybody to try. And while there's been ports of Metal Gear before, both official and unofficial, none of them were true to the original and even kind of shunned by the original creator of the Metal Gear series. Whereas this aims to be the opposite. This aims to be a quality conversion of the game. 
And it looks like Hoffman put a lot of work into this. The code was ported from the Z80 or Z80, if you're in Europe or Canada, to the X68K uh, with gameplay adjusted to work at full 50 hertz and 60 hertz modes with no slowdowns or sprite flicker in either mode. There's also multiple game modes from uh, English remixes to a new Spanish remix, as well as the original European or Japanese version, and a whole bunch of other features here. So an enhanced soundtrack, support for the CD32 gamepad, um, additional character graphics, a new ending and credit section. Uh, this really just looks like a fully loaded version of the game. So if you're a fan of the original Metal game and you have the ability to play it on an Amiga or very good Amiga emulation, I would give this a try because uh, it just seems like the true version of the game, uh, of course, as well as the original MSX2 version. But I just think anybody that grew up playing the uh, the terrible ports of this would, would really appreciate to see what it was supposed to be like. And if you have an Amiga, now you have another choice of it. The developers of Halo the Master Chief Collection have just released and concluded the flight of their new Season 7 content update, and that includes a lot of graphics fixes for things that were ported from the original Xbox to PC and were missing some of the original effects and the original look of it. So fans of the original Xbox Master Chief Collection could probably notice some of the things right away. Uh, Chris put GIFs in the post for people that want to see side-by-side -side comparisons, but it's definitely a more accurate look to the original. And it's pretty cool that all of these years later, people that want to re-experience this on a PC are able to get all of this stuff right and get the best experience out of it. So if you're a fan of Halo, I would absolutely check out Chris's post and see if this is for you. But I'm just happy to see people pay more attention to older games because just because a game is old doesn't mean it's not still awesome. So when these things are being ported and added to and new, new contents being added, I like to see uh, the attention to detail that... 343 Industries has been putting into this because I think it's uh, I just think it's really cool to re-experience these things in a new way. So check out the post and video if you're interested. Well, that's it for this time. There is a tremendous amount of construction going on outside, and I tried to record this while they were taking breaks in between loud noises and stuff, but uh, I'm not sure if any of the noise bled through. I try so hard to get the audio in these as good as I can, and I guess until I'm able to move to the burbs and build a studio in the basement, it just it is what it is. I try my best to, to re-record parts, but today I, I stumbled my words and kept power through some of the segment powering through some of the segments like this, just because I knew if I went back from the start, I would probably have to wait another 15 minutes for the jackhammers to stop. So <laughs> I'll I'll finish this one up quickly so I don't have to do that again with this. But thank you for your patience whenever there's noise in the background. Thank you to everybody that watches, listens, and plays nicely in the comments, and especially thank you to everybody who supports in any way, because it's your support that's keeping all of these videos, the channel, and the website alive. So thank you all very much, and I'll see you next week.